this one too. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andres Jaque. I'm the Dean of uh, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you and happy to be with those that are following us uh, on streaming or in the future. 
uh, but it's a great honor to not welcome, right? Like <laughs> to, to introduce uh, Professor Juan Herreros, uh, who is, uh, of course, a, a major, major person here, very much loved by, by uh, his peers, by students, by graduates, by everyone, right? Um, but, but I must say that also, it's, for me, it's very exciting because uh, the first time I came here was I was invited to a review by Juan Herreros <laughs> to one of his studios. So it's very exciting to, to keep having these conversations here at, at GSAP. Um, I, I want to say a few things about Juan, even though, of course, he's very well known by, by everyone and also for those probably that are coming here to the open house. Uh, but Juan Herreros is probably one of the uh, architects that is defending the capacity of architecture to operate uh, on behalf of societies, ecosystems, and that's something that he's been doing for many years and pioneered the vision of architecture as a discipline that was useful, I would say, to deal with social issues, with ecological issues, with issues that had to do with culture and with art, uh, and issues that were growing in, in contemporary art. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy to see that in 1984 you opened, you opened your office with Iñaki Avalos in Madrid, and that was the year that Almodovar was launching his book, his uh, film, What Have I Done to Deserve This? <laughs> and for those that are familiar with Almodovar movies, that was a very important connection. Almodovar was claiming that everything was happening in social housing on the periphery of Madrid, in the outskirts where the working class was coming from the countryside to, to, to support the industrialization of the city. Uh, uh, well, that's where the action was happening at that same year. Uh, uh, Juan Herreros, together with his partner then, Iñaki Avalos, were claiming that uh, the city centers were already kind of too explored. Uh, fancy houses was not actually the exciting uh, uh, subject of architecture, but that actually the periphery, social housing, ecology, industrialization, were the topics for architecture. And they were actually doing houses not far from the Barrio de la Concepción, where Almodov this Almodovar movie. But that also that was something of a change of reference. Uh, Juan at that point was already collecting art, actually. If, for those that have been to his house, there's all these photographs around of people that were working at that time. Uh, uh, and and, and that, that was also something that was part of his uh, practice and the conversations with Bled and Rosa, with Anthony Muntadas. Uh, uh, with many others that I, I don't want to, to forget that are somewhere here. Uh, and Montserrat Soto uh, also. People that were actually started to think of, of the way uh, class struggle was moving from, uh, from the unions to also other discussions that had to do with the, with the uh, management of toxicity, with ecology. Uh, with housing, with things that were the terrain of architecture. That was also a little bit of a revolution in the School of Architecture where Juan started to teach early at that point, uh, where he was basically claiming that uh, design should not necessarily looking at the preciousness of, uh, of the joint of marble with, uh, as everyone loved in, in Madrid, but actually looking at construction and labor and uh, uh, mechanical systems as the, as the space for architecture. In 1996, uh, he taught here, uh, and uh, with the Buell Center, he worked on tower and office from modernist, from modernist theory to contemporary practice, uh, a legendary book that he did together with Iñaki Avalos alongside with him, and that was published by MIT in 2003 with the support of the Buell Center. And that was, uh, again, a big uh, event, I would say, in architecture. Actually, uh, some for Winter would say, that you and Iñaki were the most American pragmatic architects that happened uh, to be non-American. <laughs> and they were claiming this, this uh, opportunity for pragmatism to be uh, seen as a space for, for, to, for architecture to connect with politics. And I think that was also very exciting for me. I, I was at that time also in the School of Architecture as a student, and there was these this very fresh people that were claiming that we should not see uh, go back to this uh, way of doing architecture that depended on the quality of the of the materials or the detail, but rather at what is the, the uh, of the impact that it would have in, in societies. And uh, in 2006, uh, you opened your your office, uh, Herreros Architect Ar Architectos, uh, and in 2014 you actually renamed it Studio Herreros, and and Jens Richter. Uh, became your partner, right? And, and I, but before that, in 2003, something very exciting happened. You did this memorable uh, and legendary workshop in Mallorca where you brought together Tomás Aracino that at that point was unknown. Uh, Hans Ulrich Obris, who else was there? Florian Weigel. 
Korean banker. Stefano Weri, and, and you basically claimed that energy was the topic of architecture. <laughs> and, but energy in a very creative way, you were doing these balloons <laughs> that didn't work right at that time and ended up being the whole career of Tomas Aracino that at, at this time was not uh, yet known for, for his uh, uh, Aeropolis. Uh, that was very exciting and again a way for architecture to be leading a discussion about uh, uh, the, the way ecology could operate and that ended up being also the career of Tomas Araceno. I want to also mention some of the buildings that, that you produce both uh, in association with Iñaki Avalos, like the Gordillo House, but, but for me, very important, the Valdemir Gomez Waste Treatment Center, claiming that the Waste Treatment Center was a space for uh, social uh, uh, innovation and that basically a city that could deal properly and transparently with its waste would be actually a better city, a more democratic city, or the Environmental Education Center and offices in Tenerife, uh, or the Jose Hierro Public Library, uh, or the Borman Tower in Las Palmas, all of these foundational buildings that were uh, inaugurating the way Spain would be uh, operating as a democratic country through its uh, architectural buildings, or through his, its buildings and the way its buildings were constructed, their institutions. And, why this focus on public buildings was so important for Avalos Herreros at the time that uh, uh, renowned architects were trying just to do very beautiful and kind of expensive buildings. Trust, ecology, social housing, and energy were actually <laughs> your topics. <laughs> so, and Bleda Rosa, Monse Soto, uh, Anthony Muntadas, Tomas Ateno, your friends uh, on these adventures. Uh, with Studio Herreros, I think it's important to mention also uh, the, the major buildings that you uh, work on and you uh, finished uh, the communication had in Wanju in Korea in 2011 uh, a major domestic space a collective domestic space in the in a city that was so needed of public space uh, the coastal parks in Panama again a project that was basically using the infrastructures as a ways for uh, social bettering uh, the Agora in Bogota, a major building that was seeing its function to create a, a public, uh, to contribute to the making of a public sphere in a, in a city like Bogota that is also so divided, uh, and the protection, the social houses in Central Hall in, uh, in, in Jobregat, uh, in association with the Studio Arquitectura in Mima that won the, the Father World in 2020, the High Speed Station, Pedestrian Walkway, and Clara Compo uh, Campo Amore Square. 2021, and of course the Munch Museum, that actually I'm very proud to say that also was capitalizing many of the work that you did here at GISA for all these years, uh, doing your amazing studios, uh, uh, correcting uh, typologies, looking at typologies as the starting point and looking how they were failing, how they were challenged by uh, social change and how that could be fit back into the the typology and the design. The Moon Museum, of course, was a major achievement that was celebrated internationally. But also, there were other things. You've been working on books, Le Corbusier Skyscraper, Palaces for Fun, the exhibition you did on Thirdly Price at the time that no one was talking about Thirdly Price, and he was actually forgotten by many. That was an office that I also already mentioned. Houses and public space in the 21st century in, with Akhtar, dialogue architecture. Uh, critical practice, textos criticos, lambda films. So it's a major also contribution to, to theory from design as an architect. Uh, and I want to say that, of course, this has not been invisible for our field. Juan Herreros uh, has the International Fellowship from RIVA, from the Royal Institute of British Architects. He has the ICON and the AD Architectural Award, the Medal of the Arts of the City in San Lorenzo, when you were born, right? <laughs> yeah. You were raised, right? Uh, the A Plus Career Award, the FAD Award in multiple occasions. So uh, it's, of course, a huge honor that uh, Juan is a, a crucial member of our uh, gang, I, I <laughs> want to say, at GSAP, and, uh, and that he, he is making dial contributions daily to what we are. I also very happy that uh, Lola Benalong will be joining me in responding to Juan and, and moderating a debate, the Q&A after the, his lecture. Lola Benalong, of course, is the is professor at, at GSAP and is the director of the Nat Natural Material Lab and also the coordinator of the, of the architecture uh, tech sequence and a major architect that is rethinking the materiality of architecture as a living uh, uh, component. Uh, perfect to, to go on and to continue the discussion on ecology, trust, 
uh, politics, uh, 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 and that Juan has been launching for, for many years now. So Juan, welcome here again, or we welcome or whatever. You <laughs> take your, your space here. That thank you, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Thank you, Andres, for this introduction. I didn't remember I had done so many things. Uh, but it's good. <laughs> it's good to know. Uh, uh, time goes fast. No? Um, I have a title for this lecture, Designing Unexpected Opportunities. Uh, and this is a way of saying thank you also. No? Thank you for being all of you here today. And, and thank you for inviting me to, to give the lecture of the Open House Day. It's, it's for me important because I, ha I have been for, I don't know, 17 times in the Open House Day, uh, having bad sandwiches, no? and, and, but today <laughs> this is much better. Um, designing, designing is the uh, added value. So what we do here uh, with, I think, architects all around the world that try to do something, uh, consider that design is beyond solving problems. No? Solving problems is OK. It's not that bad. <laughs> but design is did this added value that we can create unexpected opportunity or unexpected values, unexpected uh, giving back something that nobody has asked you to do, but you, thanks to architecture, uh, can provide. No? The, the questions. Uh, around this statement is, is to ask ourselves honestly, uh, what's the value of what we do? How social, how critical, how inventive, how engaged, how political is our practice? Really, when we, when, not, not with banal statements of proclamations, just when we do a project, when we enter a competition, how we choose any opportunity, how we, how we select what we do, how we focus no, the interest of any of the uh, cases we work with in order to get that added value. No? So the question, the second question is how can we contribute to the construction of a better world? And the third, you have talked, Andres, about this being useful, being useful for others. This is a service. We are architects, no? So um, not only others in terms of users or citizens, also others, colleagues, schools, students, young generations, what we do to let or to help architecture to grow, no? That's my, my, my concern. I, I don't know if getting it, but uh, uh, it's in what uh, I, I work you know, um, every day. So. How can we transform all these concerns into architecture? Is what I, I try to show you some samples. Perhaps you like them or not. No. <laughs> but um, I, I do this around three topics. One is mitigation or reparation. The other is new domesticities. And the third will be typological inventions or typological corrections, as many of you know that I have been working in this uh, around years in this school, no? Infrastructural mitigations, this is a problem that we, we deal with many times, no? And it's about things that happen. Nobody knows in which moment they started, but we receive them as very problematic, no? So you see this road, you see what is happening on the right, this is industrial estate, you see what's happening on the left, this marginalized neighborhood, no? Flooded and full of water and we automatically understand that there is a problem of um, marginalization. You know? But also, we see, discover one day that this neighborhood that is marginalized for ecological, social, and topographical reasons is going to be re marginalized thanks to the progress, th thanks to the highways. You know? So the highways are going to go all around the neighborhood and don't leave in these people any capability of co being connected in a natural way with the rest of the city, with the rest of the citizens, no? or with the rest of the communities. No? So our response to this problem was thinking that all the land inside this circuit is private. Uh, Asked the Ministry of, of Public Affairs of Panama 
to give us the leftovers of the highway, the spaces, the left spaces in between the nodes. Uh, and working with these patterns of the traditional indigenous uh, textile works that perhaps you know, many people in this room for sure know the molas and how important they are in domesticity and in the dress of the celebrations of, of many uh, uh, different communities and very, very ca few, a few countries in Latin America and, and Central America to create a pattern or a collection of patterns for the floor because this is not only about connecting, no? connecting the people or doing bridges or whatever. No, I, I saw a couple of bridges anyway. But it's more about the constructing of an identity, uh, the construction of a proudness of belonging to this community. So the plan was give me these places with, uh, without any value. Uh, let me pave with these specific colors of this neighborhood that is, is something to identify this community. Let me put some basket fields playgrounds and places to escape from the compressed area where these people are living. <coughs> and, and also, why you don't organize a training of the unemployed people of this neighborhood to work in the construction and to, put, to, to, to learn something about construction that can, can help them to get a job. No? So this is how bad they did the first week. Look at this floor. It's really very, <laughs> very bad done. No? Uh, but in two weeks, this was done like this. No? It's, it's quite well. So the, the design is, he, is here giving dignity to the people. Uh, it's very simple. It's super cheap. No? Uh, even has uh, some complicated situations in, 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 in contact and friction with infrastructures. But in some moments, we would say it's a heavy situation, but the sidewalks and all these areas that are incredibly active no, every day no, of people and not only children, also no, uh, old men and women uh, who come here to, to exercise that perhaps they, they had not done that before. No? And, and you see, you see the, the bridge and these the pavements and the different of levels to protect from the, from the highway, from the noise, from the pollution, because actually it's not one of these super developed highways that you can find in the US. No? It's more innocent everything, the way the people use the place, inventing how to come here you know, and, and use this simple, you know, and having these new centers of gravity of the life. You know? So we, we, we are saying the children living in the center, perhaps in much better houses, in much better conditions and ecological ecosystems, have to be taken by their parents 30 minutes away Saturdays mornings to go to a club, a private club, to do some sport. No? Here they only have to cross the, path, the, the pathway and land in these areas. No? We have done many of these projects. No? In this case, I want to show you an historical reparation, a reparation of more than 100 years. Let me see where is here. OK. This is Santiago de Compostela. It's a historical center, a medieval town, wallet town, and, and for centuries. Uh, this is the train. So the train came to Santiago, arrived in Santiago 130 years ago. But the track couldn't um, come up the level of the city because it was so, so high that the 2% that the train can come up was not enough. So at, at the end, we have an embankment, artificial embankment here of 12, 12 meters. That means that the city became segregated from, the, from this area. When you see this green, it's the good side of the coin. No? It was preserved because it was inaccessible. So it was not developed for years. And today is declared uh, an ecological patrimony, especially this tiny river here that is a very rich uh, ecosystem. No? But also many people install it here because being inaccessible, the land was very cheap. So a community of low-income people uh, landed here, mixed it with industries, and have a very bad relation with the center. These two red dots are like 1,400 meters uh, far one to the other, uh, are the only options of crossing the track of the train 
and entering the city. But you have to cross under the tracks, so they are tunnels. So they are not good to do that walking. Of course, it's not good for children. It's not good to come back late night to your home after a Friday night gathering with your friends. It's not good for wheelchairs. It's not good for trolleys with babies. So that means that the people here is totally condemned to live there, uh, compressed and, 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 and prisoners of the, of the infrastructure. Uh, we knew this problem very well for uh, other reasons. So the day that was launched the competition to design the high-speed train the station of Santiago de Compostela, we said, OK, we want to go. And we want to cross the tracks with the station. So the station will be the solution to this problem. This problem was a problem for us. So nobody was complaining of, of this situation. It was totally accepted. No? And nobody thought that could be solved so fast and, and easy way. So here you see this, this station. This is the crossing connecting the center, historical center, and the, this, this development on the this settlement on the, on the south. And of course, this bridge is connecting the bus station and the railway station and all these intermodal uh, strategies. But basically, we were sure that this uh, three million, three stupid millions of euros were going to solve an incredible problem. No? The, the proposal was so successful, we won the competition of the station, but the local governments asked, please, to buy the bridge. So they knew that the construction of the station was going to take 10 years. No? But the bridge could be built in nine months. No? So the bridge is not a bridge. The bridge is like a building. The bridge is 12 meters wide. So it's not this weak weakness that all we feel if you have to cross a highway in a tiny and, and go up from the stairs and uh, all this. Uh, situations is like a, it's a place with light, 24 hours, protecting from the rain, protecting from the wind. So the connection is more like a street. Actually, now it's being named with with the name of Clara Campamor as a new street of the of the city. No, so this is it. No, it's this long room, long urban room, where you can get a refugee of the bad climate conditions, and you can cross, of course, in the night, and you can resolve this 12 meters difference level you know, with this you know, the embankment here to get the entrance to the bus station, and of course, the um, Clara Campomor Square, you know, with this gesture of opening the mouth, opening the door, calling the people to cross, come to the center. Also, the people from the center now can go to the uh, green uh, protective, protected uh, area with the bicycles, walking with the children. They don't have to take the car to go a uh, green space that is three blocks away of your home. No? So that is uh, the revolution. No? And this is the piece the, of architecture that we presented to the municipality and to the regional government when they asked it to, to, to build the, the bridge. And this is to talk about labor that you have also mentioned. No? Uh, a very fast, uh, no, so only a few of the many beautiful images we have of these um, columns and these technologies. No? And this is also interesting. When you, you have to do a construction like this, five hours per night, no, from uh, 11.30 till 5 in the morning. This is the only moment that there is no trains crossing because it's impossible to cut a train. This is a sacred uh, decision for a, a railway uh, responsible. No? So we could do these incredibly advanced concrete uh, uh, pillars with low uh, carbon footprint uh, material and do it during the night with these incredible cranes here. You know, this crane that is traveling all around Europe and getting a landing in a place. It takes three weeks to install the crane. He has to do this, this work. But what I really love is how at the end, with all this, you, you need to have these men doing the last <laughs> work, no? like helping the iron to get into the hole of the 45 tons piece. No? <laughs> so this is also uh, something related to, to the love uh, making things. No? So to build this piece, this fragment, this is 40 meters long piece by the tracks during days and days, uh, just to have one magic night in which the crane is going to transport this to land on the top of the 
of the pillars. And I'm not a fascinated person by the heroism of architecture. I'm bringing this, not to talk about this testosterone uh, energy, it's more about this love. No, this guy is like Mick Jagger. Uh, <laughs> it's like Mick Jagger because he gets the place, uh, walk around, start the situation, goes into the crane and works for three hours or four hours or five hours just to get this. No? I think it's like Mick Jagger, like Mick Jagger getting the stage, the guitars are there, perfectly <laughs> prepared. He has not to test the sound, no, nothing. It's just start working. No? So, and after that, he goes to the hotel and next day, perhaps he's in Amberes or in Switzerland or whatever, doing the same operation. But at the end, he has to do this. No? And let me show you again you know, the concentration of this person. No? It's really amazing. And this is the labor no, when we, we ask ourselves, and, and, and in this auditorium, no, for this last year, we have listened many times, who built, who built our buildings? No? This guy, for example. No? Um, so at the end, the bridge was built. The pieces there, we have all these elevators and ramps and mechanical stairs that are helping the people to cross the beginning of the, this square that now is much more uh, growth and big trees. And in the night, it's like offering this security of the artificial light and this transformation no? during the day is more opaque piece there, no? but in the night it reveals a kind of transparency and, and a presence of a collective uh, benefit. You know? uh, and the day it was open uh, was magic because the people visiting the place was not like a tourist, no? So they were not walking, like not going anywhere. No, they were crossing the bridge, no? These guys perhaps were, by the first time in their life, going to the uh, ecological park to exercise walking, no? And they were so, so happy for these ch children that were discovering that could go walking to the school in four minutes without, you know, protected from the rain, without uh, having their parents taken there by car, because the school and the health, uh, the, the uh, health centers uh, and, and the, the, all the public systems in, uh, uh, that in Spain are good enough, but they are in the other side of the track, no? the tracks. No? So if you have to go to the, to the doctor, you need somebody taking you there. No? And all these wheelchairs, it was like a surprise how many people was celebrating that in so, so many years they could finally cross by themselves without help this, this bridge. No? And this platform, this observatory from where you can see the outskirts of Santiago, you can see the, that neighborhood that was marginalized for so long time. And you can also see the Ciudad de la no, uh, <coughs> City of Culture by Peter Eisenman that is, is actually abandoned and not in use because it's inaccessible for, by the same, the same reason. Mm -hmm. no? And in every meeting, every visit to the construction with any economical problem, with any tiny thing, they say, okay, we can we can eliminate the platform, the Juan's platform. You know? And so I had to fight to get this platform in the place. Not, not useful for any other than for this, you know? for half the people there looking at their city, understanding the history of the train, why the train came, what was the problem, what was the good and the bad <laughs> side of the coin. And this woman, perhaps the first time also looking the, the, her neighborhood with another feeling, no? Because he, he, she hated the neighborhood for all, all her life, thinking that was marginalized from the, from the center. And the, in, the, in this moment, I was saying, oh, it's, it's beautiful. I like it, no? Here you see the city of culture by Peter Eisenman, no? Okay. So this piece, small piece, has changed the center of gravity of the city. And this is the uh, unpredicted benefit, or the unpredicted opportunity, you know, when we won that competition. And now we are working in, in this, in the station in itself. It's, it's, it's much more bigger, expensive, and sophisticated building. But perhaps I'm not going to be more happy than the day of the opening of the, of the bridge. Um, Living Together has been a slogan. Uh, uh, quite frequent in the last times, no? Uh, but uh, we have worked very intensely in the, um, in the signif significance of this expression, no? Living together, no? Perhaps the city 
is, I don't know if he's the only, but for sure is one of the topic we, we, we have been able of, of building and keeping and, 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 and making incredible agreements around this topic of, of living together. But we, 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 we composed this, this drawings years ago, this, this collage, no? Like, what we would like to happen in our residential buildings, especially in the social house, you know, especially in a type of social building that, of, of social building that we were very interested in was the, the ones that mix market and social housing. You know? uh, and in this, we could say, okay, the people should meet in a situation like this because perhaps there are knowledges that can be shared by these different income groups or different specialized levels of, levels of specialization. Also can happen this, if we see this and we see this rooftop, we understand very fast what's happening here and what kind of integration and diversity and possibilities of discovering something in the others can, can happen. No? This is also about sharing, uh, I hate the word amenities, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, because amenities, well, perhaps it's because in Spanish, um, amenidad is something like, it's a very weak time, very banal time, no? Uh, but amenities, no? But these share programs where the people can enlarge the tiny size of their apartments and they can find a kind of luxury uh, because the luxury is totally different from one group to another, no? So the, what is this room for? what you want, I don't know. You can come to work, but have you, you can do a small party. It's not a question of putting names to the program. It's more a question of finding the moment, moments in which you really feel that your life is being better thanks to architecture. No? This is the building. This is Marseille. Uh, this is one of the two buildings I'm going to show. Sorry, it's in Marseille. And it's a result of a, of a very complex uh, regulations. This different levels, and I, I, I like the, those regulations that were designed by Yves Leon uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, I, I think, uh, smart um, uh, urban, uh, urban plan you know, for, this, for this place. But, the, but we, we won this competition and we built the building with the argument of doing a public ground gar floor garden, uh, community terraces for shared uh, activities, and private galleries in each apartment. You know? So uh, our buildings are the two ones on the right. And this is the third element. You know? This was the first building, perhaps many of you know, this regulation in France that you are obliged when you do more than 150 uh, apartments in the building to provide a number of social housing. That, that, that question was solved historically doing a second door, a second stair, and a second social group, not mixing. Uh, no. so this was the first time that we, we convince the, 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 the committee uh, to let us do the same lobby, the same shared terraces and, 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 and help perhaps the children that they don't know that much about social classes to meet and, 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 to, and to exchange uh, their experiences. So this is the public uh, garden that is only closed in the, in the nights and, and originally was going to be private. No, you see here this fence that is close in the, in the night. Uh, the green terraces as you go up. And the, uh, the here was you know, at the beginning of the growing. And you see these programs that are shared, but all the, you know, the inhabitants. You know. This is also about uh, this quality, non-taking non non care of the luxury joints, no? There is a moment in which we, we build too well. <laughs> Sorry for saying this. We will do well till the end, no? There is a moment in which you can, no? we can keep this unfinished. And with this feeling that everything you need is already there, perhaps the money can go to another place. And this idea that the time is not stopped, the, the, the evaluation of the building has not uh, started because it's still under construction. No? And, and, and that's a spirit that I really like, you notice know, that you are living in something that can be better, perhaps, in the future, you know, when some money comes or, or, or whatever. You know? And these are the private terraces of, uh, of the apartments you know, with these shutters that are controlling the wind, especially in, in Marseille, the Mistral is a very 
a complicated wind because it's coming from the wood view always, you know, uh, from, the, from the seashore. And it's, you know, so many people prefer to live in the west and not have a good view just to, uh, instead of negotiating the, the Mistral. You know. But these galleries are uh, now full of green and the people are living uh, with uh, this phenomenological you know, relation with the climate conditions. You know. and this is the kitchen and I want to conclude here the kitchen to start with this other kitchen, the, the other project. You know. This kitchen is in Barcelona, is a, the, is a project on Samboy and it's also to demonstrate how domesticity is changing or can change thanks to very small movements like put the kitchen in the, in the, in the living, uh, not, not in the living, in, 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 the, in the lobby of the, of the, of the, uh, of the apartments. No? So this is an open kitchen that's the door of the house. Uh, you are living like in a small village with uh, this courtyard outside. The kitchen is not at the end of the corridor with the closed door. Behind the door there is a woman cooking. No, this is the center of, of conversations. This is now every, every member of the family can cook. And, 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 and the kitchen is social, is a place for discussions. We could say this uh, the substitute of the chimney and is the substitute perhaps of the TV. You know, uh, because it's, it's a, an active place, you know, and this is the courtyard you know, where this, this is the door of that apartment. So this courtyard belongs to this building. So you discover that you are not in the ground, you are like in the fourth or fifth floor. The building is quite repetitive, quite simple, only one constructing detail, only one shutter, only one window, you no know, six materials more or less. Uh, is the only way of building this affordable housing with some quality in terms of space and architecture and uh, at the same time with the price that we have. So this social housing is built social and uh, low income market housing together are built with a ridiculous amount of, of, of price per square meter uh, and it's the same price that cost all the social housing that you can see in the roads of Spain. But here this effort of understanding that is precisely the construction and the materiality where the money is and the repetition of the operations as many times as possible uh, can really help the building to be better and cheaper. No? This is a drawing to express that we, we had no context uh, in, in, in this case. Where I have been always de defending that every place has a history and every place is a context, but in this case it was very difficult because these were the social housing that we were uh, fighting against. Uh, this is an industrial estate. Fortunately, there is a park here designed by Badia Roche, uh, good architects from Catalonia doing landscape architecture. Uh, and our, our building was here totally isolated. And that's why uh, we decided to, to, to build this block, very, very dense and very simple and very clear with, I understand, very beautiful proportions. You know, uh, with these cuts, sometimes too late, as you have seen, some apartments to come out or to create some diversity in the programs. But basically the life is around this courtyard with these corridors that allow you to get in your, in your home. And the <coughs> corridors are wide enough to have bicycles, plants, children playing. So you can go to your apartment and you can with the take care of the children. No? Uh, and that is really creating an incredible life. And this is the periphery of Barcelona. It's a, it's a place with many immigrants, uh, many of them are have uh, no, the children have been born in already in, in Catalonia and many gypsies. No, there's a famous gypsy communities in, in Catalonia living together, living together. Something that was apparently impossible only a few years ago. So these are the gestures that we are doing into this <coughs> super pragmatic and rigid uh, monolithic building that looks to be very serious and very boring, but it's not because <laughs> inside we have these galleries and we have these colors and with this gentle architecture that is receiving you with some gestures and some traditional ways of using certain materials that are automatically recognized by the people. No? So they, they have lived perhaps in their childhoods in, in, uh, surrounded by this kind of colors and, 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 and protections. No? Because and, and the, the 
this ceramic, the cheapest ceramic material as possible. This is Mariona Benedito, I introduced you to her, our partner <laughs> in Catalonia for all the projects we do. And also this window, you not know, thinking that every place has a history. At the end, the history, like in Santiago, is because we can frame this landscape and be sure that we can do something to increase the quality. You know, these windows are much bigger than usual in social housing, in not, uh, not only in Spain, in many other places. You know, and so the, it's very simple, everything, but at the same time, it's very, I think, in, in light in, in terms of not being exigent, but intense in the, in the possibilities of having an everyday life, you know, like not non, uh, non segregated from from the because the social reasons or, or whatever. No? So this is this is this was this was a congress center. Was in the competition. Uh, this is, was the competition for the International Congress Center of Bogota. Um, and this chapter uh, is the one devoted to typological corrections you know, or typological inventions. You know. We have done a few competitions where we started thinking, what can we say new about this problem? What can we say about Congress centers? You know? At that moment, Spain was like many other countries in the world in the economical crisis uh, after 2008, which was like 2011. The Congress centers were blocked because the congresses, as you know, are organized with the excellence of the companies. No? So if the companies were in this bad moment uh, in terms of not having money to organize congresses, the buildings were closed. But they were closed not because there was no congresses. They were closed because in the typical congresses centers, the only thing you can do is congresses. So uh, the auditorium of a congress is, an, uh, is a very and useful for any other thing. This is a slightly sloped with a tiny, stupid uh, stage with no technology, you know, with no back rooms uh, or camer no camerinos, uh, backstage. Uh, so only four or five people discussing about cardiology things can, can stay there. You know? So we, our first decision was to do flat auditoriums for this place for this center. The second was to stock them instead of having all horizontal. Stocking them, we could create this public square. That means this is a building. This is a 75,000 square, 75 square meters, 17,000 square meters uh, in Bogota. It's the biggest building in the city. Why we give this building only to dentists and, and, and travel agencies to do congresses. You know, can be useful for many other things. It's out of the, uh, it's in the periphery, has a 3,000 parking lot uh, underneath. You can do the best uh, electronic music rapes uh, in all Latin America. You can do parties, you can do film festivals, you can do competitions of judo, karate, ping pong. There are many things to do just in a room big enough and high enough. You know. And also, uh, if this is public, so this is not the typical lobby of the Congress Center, we have this other small uh, lobbies from where I have relation with the landscape and understand the history. Again, this is a personal obsession, sorry for that. Uh, understand that the cerros, for sure, someone from Bogota here, the cerros, the savanna, the new developments close to the airport, the historical center can be discovered from there. So the people visiting the city by the first time, they can use the building as a device to understand the city. But basically the intention is that the people from, from the city, the people from Bogota, have to go to this place three, four, five times a year because there are things happening there that are not only for exclusive professional meetings. No? So this is the main, this main square and this project is basically about collaboration, no? uh, and I want to, to talk basically only about that. No? Uh, how these discussions or these conversations and, and, and dialogues with all the experts are present in the construction and are present in the elimination of the topics of this kind of buildings, and at the same time, the apparition of some other that for us are totally new and, and have been revolutionary in the success of the, 
of the building. And this is always a consequence of a discussion between uh, cooks. No? The, around a the table, Daniel Bermudez, the architect who was our partner in this, in this project, started drawing this because we were pointing, we have to do a really uh, ambition, uh, uh, and, an, an, an ambition in terms of sustainability that is going beyond saving energy or whatever. No, you have to do something to show that not only the building, but also the country, this was in, in a very crucial moment for the history of Colombia, uh, uh, was going to, to demonstrate no, that uh, the kind of updating of the, of the building. And we decided to try to do cross natural ventilation for 75,000 square meters where you can feed 8,000 people in a, a reggaeton concert, no? <laughs> so uh, the experts in, 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 in climate, artificial climate, they said, no, you are not going to be able of doing that. Uh, even, even being in Bogota, the perfect climate for that, no? Because it's around 20, between 17 and 26 degrees, no? Every day. Uh, you will need uh, two meters and a half vacuum slab of air moving so slowly, no? And the guy, the structural designer, the BOMA, uh, Aguilo, uh, said, if you give me two meters and a, and a half, I take out all the columns of the building. <laughs> no. So uh, this innocent drawing with six or seven different hands became into this other uh, beautiful technical drawing with these four enormous columns and these other tiny columns with a span of uh, 20, th 32 uh, meters between them. And uh, the slabs became really big and, and deep and we can see here, so the air comes in, goes through, got into the atrium, the atrium becomes the element of uh, accumulation of the air before going up and being eliminated, uh, exhausted in the, in, the, in the roof. And it's working perfectly. We had here two parallel conversations, one of the uh, locals uh, and local engineers that were trusting absolutely in the possibility of doing it. And the others were a super uh, engineer company like Arup that were all time thinking in the liability. Uh, and, and not being so sure. But uh, Arup helped us to do things like this. This is the interior of the slab. So if the slab is two meters and, and a half, you need to draw what is happening inside the, inside the slab. No? So inside the slab, you can put bathrooms, you can put a, you can storage, you can put cars, you can put what you want. No? And, 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 and that's why the building became a new, a, a totally new, uh, Organism. I, I, I had not uh, dealt de with, with a situation like this. And uh, this is part of our obsession that even construction details have to, have to show architecture, no? have, to, have to understand that there is a question of transitions, uh, emotions of going under this not so high cut to get into this outside lobby uh, kind of uh, yes, lobby, uh, like a th atrium, and going into the, into the building, not this, this situation. But Arup uh, helped us to, to do all the programs uh, related to study the movement of the air, and how if you start with the building totally blocked and coded during the night, it's starting at 17 degrees. You can have all the you know, thousands of people you want till <coughs> 11 in the night, you know, the moment in which you have to open totally the building because the temperature is becoming 27 degrees. So you have to open to get the building cold during the night again. No? So these are uh, animated uh, diagrams. I'm sorry, not having animated because they are like uh, 1,000 <laughs> gigas each of them. I can show in a, in, a, in a presentation like this. You see there, this is ready for a banquet uh, or concert, so wherever. But this is again the moment of this question of the quality and the question of what, what we show, what we hide, you know? 
So the moments that the oh, sorry, sorry. The moment that the body touches the building, touches the fences, touches the doors, the quality is gentle and, and humble. No? But in the moment you only touch the things with your eyes, you don't need that. No? So the building is again unfinished. And the building remains this uh, expression of so we're not necessarily how it works, but uh, a certain compromise with a concept of beauty and a, 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 a concept of quality. So thanks to that, in the Colombian context where construction of public buildings has a very low budget, we can have good materials in other moments, no? much better than, than usual. No? For example, in the glazing. No? The glazing is a beautiful story. One of the conclusions of these animations was that it was impossible to call the building uh, between 11 in the night and 7 in the morning uh, again, because the building in itself was like a, a grid, like a jail of heat. No? So it was not enough to uh, open the building. So we, 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 we had to, to reduce the quality of the glasses. Uh, so uh, there are many, many simple glasses uh, not using the double glass with camera uh, that does a signal of quality. So in this case, the quality came from this other family. Now, um, I'm going fast. I know the images are beautiful. This is one of those lobbies from where you understand the city, all oh, these beautiful rooms. This is the big salon on the top that has no columns. These were 5,000 people. Uh, can fit uh, in, a, in an event. No? And we were saying in the, in, the, in the presentation of the project, we were asking about if, this, if the rooms are flat, if there is no stages, uh, if you have all these um, um, storage rooms in each floor from where you can move cars and tables and whatever, um, what, uh, what can we, how, how can we explain the, the building? And we said this is a meeting, this is a building for meetings of five to 5,000 people. No? <laughs> so, and that is fortunately what has happened. Uh, many things uh, are programmed in this place. Also was a wonderful uh, campaign hospital during the pandemic. And uh, at the end, uh, Norberto Chavez, uh, conceptualist, uh, Argentinian Catalan conceptualist, uh, helped us to find this new name, Agora Bogota, of forgetting the idea of the conventions that is here in small you know, capital letters. There is no international anymore because it's international. You know? So if you, if you say something international, it's because it's not international. <laughs> you, never, you, know, you, you never say uh, ca uh, Catholic Church International, no? <laughs> Coca-Cola International. No? So um, I, I want to go fast this. We have, we have to invent how to draw, how to, how to calibrate the number of, of glasses, uh, uh, of glazing, the different qualities, how we were losing or earning in terms of energy when we changed uh, them, how many millions we need uh, and in which positions and what we, what, what happen if, if we don't have money enough and we have to reduce. Uh, at the end, uh, the, 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 this compact uh, system was totally built in Spain and, and, and coming by boat. And these are these, uh, um, I, ales, branchias, ales? I look this word in the dictionary today. Gills, <laughs> uh, gills, yes. So uh, that are, no, as you see, slowly being opened to get the amount of fresh air that, that the building needs. So the building is alive. It's a kind of reactive object, a reactive dinosaur. No? And in the night, you discover this volume in uh, the scale of the natural uh, accidents of the, of the city, the mountains. No? And we also studied the repercussion of this piece in the city in terms of wind and, and heat. And at the end, it's there. And it's, it's, a, it's not a congress center. It's more like a place where go for wonderful things, for wonderful plans. And the citizens of Bogota are using it uh, as much as the, the visitors, no? The second uh, and the last project I want to show you, I don't know how much time. Good. Um, it's the Munch Museum. This guy is really happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this image is, 
is, is not that happy because this, this image was during the pandemic. So the building had been completed in, in November uh, 2019. Uh, so the responsibles of the building were thinking on opening immediately, but the winter was coming or was already there. So they decided to postpone to spring just to have a very uh, florious and gorgeous opening of the building. And the pandemic came and the building was closed till 2000, October 2021, 21st. No? And so this image is taken by Ivan Ban uh, in some trips he did to the, to the, to the city. You see here, you know, the, the monk still sleeping perfectly completed, but not open, you know, and, and this, I, I love these images, you no? you see something like this social distance of these guys, you know, something <laughs> that we learned in those days, no, uh, but the building is there resisting, no, uh, this is exactly the moment in which the pandemic started to uh, disappear slowly, so it was po possible to gather in, in the street, but the building was not still open, and this is coming from this. This is for me super important. This is the collective dream of getting the water. No? Of, you know, the, as you know, the uh, industrial uh, port uh, with all the containers in, this, in the center of Oslo was removed to go out of the fjord. And the city had the possibility of growing till the water. Uh, after eliminating highways and building tunnels and you know, they're doing a, a quite an ambitious uh, project. But, but the result of this ambitious project is, is this, no? or this. No? It's more like a naturalness of getting the water walking or walk along the, uh, the coast uh, or, or bicycle or, or, or whatever. No? So this is the building already built, but uh, it's, it's here this image too take you that the next week after no and Gary knows very well about this after winning the competition we received a lot of complaints about the hate at that moment it was only the hate of the building uh, because apparently uh, Oslo was not a, a city of uh, high-rise buildings high rise of 55 square meters no? um, so we had to to answer architects we know to do very few things one is talk the other is draw, <laughs> drawing. You know? So we, we did many drawings showing that the building is not so uh, high and was not going to be so high because the neighborhood that, 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 this, that didn't exist at that time was going to be built. But the barcode was already at the construction and it was like, like that. No? And the other drawing we produced, uh, important, very important uh, in, this, in this conversation, was this one. So we never said, no, the building is not that high. You know, we say, okay, let, let us see how high the, is the, the, the building is. But this was more important. You know, this is the town hall of, of uh, Oslo. This building is perhaps the most important building, uh, the, the, the cover in all the architectural guides of the city all around the world. And, and it was a stop it, uh, you know, in between the construction of the podium and the towers, I don't know, 30 years or something passed uh, because the discussion of if Oslo could have a high rise building for the town hall. You know, finally, it was built and, and, and it's the best. You know? So, okay. And my uh, explanation was we have the building with this gesture, with this gentle uh, reverence to the city to the artificial construction, to the dream of recuperating all this for the citizens. Not, it's not looking to the fjord it's like a tourist. It's not taking a picture of the islands. It's just looking to the proudness of the opera that was already there. And this straight connection with the, with the town hall. You know, from the fourth floor, you can look over the medieval town here. You know, and it is a beautiful dialogue between the democracy, the politic as the art of living together, and culture, no? The place, the museums are the place where we have to rewrite our history, is the past, the present, and the future. What, where are we coming from? What we are, and what we want to be in the future, no? And these two buildings are having a conversation between them uh, about what we do, <laughs> no? How we do it. Um, also, we did a lot of work about 
blocking views or not, moving a little bit the building to not blocking some uh, perceptions. And finally, this uh, discussion uh, finished and another more political discussion came that we are not architectural, we, are not, we were not part of them. But Eric Fisher published in, in, in this, is, this the, the competition was launched in 2008 and, and we won that in March 29th, 2009. Uh, exactly in that moment, or a few months before, Eric Fischer has published the collection of maps. Perhaps you know this, no? This, sorry, sorry. These maps that are done with the vectors of the, of the photos that the tourists upload to the internet. And this is, this is pre-Instagram. This is like, I don't know, <coughs> Flickr or something. <laughs> Prehistory <laughs> pre of uh, internet, no? Um, but but this is, there are many maps for sure is your city, so look, look for it. Eric Fischer, this is fast. Uh, and you recognize the city only with these vectors. No? In the case of Oslo, no, the Bigelands Park, the islands with the museums, no, the bay with the, with the town hall, the main, no, Gorgius Street, the Royal Palace, and the opera by Esnojeta. So in that moment, we discovered that the opera by uh, was being a uh, center, a new center you know, of gravity of the city. Perhaps selfies are not enough <laughs> to define a center, but for sure this was a good demonstration of the capability of a, city, of a building to change the city. You know? um, and we um, answered to the competition brief you know, that was in a certain way asking for a redefinition of the contemporary museum. No? Uh, I think it's very, in a very smart way, uh, the organizers of the competition were uh, trying to avoid uh, the gorgeous expression of the post Bilbao Guggenheim buildings. No? I think that finally many of the competitors did. No? Um, and we, we were saying, mm, perhaps not. Uh, our plan is to do a vertical building, because also like in Bogota to stack the auditorium here, stack the, the museum. We thought that was an, was an exploration and a research that something good could, could reveal. The first was the, the reduction of the footprint of the building. So we give back to the municipality 80% of the, of the land, uh, of the site of the, of the, of the competition. Like, uh, thank you very much. We don't need it. Uh, and now it's a beautiful beach. And perhaps in the future it's going to be built a new, uh, one more small museum there. Um, the second was this idea of going up, going up because with this system of vertical public space, of these platforms and stairs, there is a device, again, to discover the history of Oslo. So in each of these levels, you are reading a new skyline of the, of the city from the big import that is under your, under your building and to the medieval uh, uh, era, 19th century, industrial, uh, 19th century industrialization, 20th century, etc. No? But the most important is this podium, this body, because we said, uh, our critique, and many of you know this because it's part of my studio and the last studios here, is museums are too focused in tourists. No? The museums are not part of the everyday life of the citizens. The, the major museums in the world are not interested in get, of having the people there every day. No? Uh, and the reason for that is to don't show where those activities that basically do the locals are. You, nobody knows where the children uh, that go to the children programs in the major museums in New York, where they are, no, only the parents, no, of course, uh, that had to go to the third basement, perhaps. No? Uh, so we did this podium, and this podium is a kind of cultural center. We always define is it as a public indoor square, where you have what you have in a, in a square of a small village, you have a restaurant, you have a shop, you have a library, you have a school that is the educational center, you have a research center, you have an auditorium, you have a cinema, and you have a museum. And the museum is in the tower. No? And the tower is divided in this circulation system and the solid, no? what we call the uh, dynamic museum and the static museum, that is a collection of floors, not all of them with art, because uh, we are not using the, the possibility that given by the competition of uh, doing basements, because there are those basements were terribly expensive. And also, it's also a, a try, you know, let's say basements, can we 
don't do basement for once in our life, no? Uh, this was a good opportunity, no? Because the water there, of course. And, but we will talk about this uh, solid uh, piece of uh, building, this uh, static museum, because it's, it's where many other programs are um, in, uh, included, no? So this is the scheme that we, we draw for, for this building, also for the Malva, the refurbishment of the Malva Museum in Buenos Aires that we were doing at that time. Uh, and it was be in between the city and the exhibition spaces. What we have is the part of the museum that the people uses. It's the, it's the place where you go because there is a good thing, because there is a good lecture, because you want to buy a present or friend, because you want to the library to do some homework in the school or, or whatever. No? So all these programs are here and the exhibitions are there. So this is the skin. This is actually from the competition where we have this mixing functions in this you know, going up till the observation the deck and the restaurant. But in the meantime, you can see many of these departments. You can discover the restoration department. You can discover the library. You can discover the administration department. So the children, especially, can understand that there are 250 people working every day. So this is not a cemetery. It's, a, it's an active place. No? And so this is the lobby. This is this system of apparently random stairs are not random at all, as you can imagine. This is this dynamic uh, part of the circulation system. And this is also uh, full of intention in terms of the, the dynamic part is lightly, perhaps noisy, where you move fast, you know, and the rooms for art are dark, you move slowly, and are silent. And, and we will see something of that. We also learned that the muse contemporary museums are having no more, or will have in the, or are starting to, don't have more than 40% of the surface devoted to conventional galleries. So the formats of art, the different uh, activities, and the richness of the programs, like uh, especially education and, and some others, like research, are taking uh, the surface of these buildings and, and the old-fashioned directors perhaps are uh, frustrated because they have to deal with many other uh, activities than organizing exhibitions. But I, I think it's a, it's a big conquest of, a, of the citizenship, no? of, this, um, uh, of the citizens, uh, th this, this variety. You know? And here you understand this perfe perfectly. And here is this you know, combination only the, the green is exhibition, the white is any other things. And here you have this view of the library from one of the mechanical stairs going up. You know. but this is also, I, uh, I don't want to be late, uh, but I need a minute to explain this. <laughs> because the, the, we, we did a research, uh, 2008, remember, about all the exhibitions going around, or the temporary exhibitions going around the world in muse from museum to museum had 60, 650 square meters, 350, or 1,000. And the ones having 1,000, they are, uh, we are asking the museums to host these exhibitions to have two rooms, one of 650 and one of 350. Because usually it's the small format, the cabinet, the documentation center of the big one. No? So that's why we say, OK, we will do these rooms. So you are circulating here, you enter the room, you cross, come to the other, go out, and well, I had done the opposite. You have to like that, this here. And I come back to the, to the transport system. No? So that means that you are never watching a painting, and a group of 30 people are walking behind you because they want to go to the Rembrandt. No? So, so, it's not, uh, so the, the ceremony of attending the art is uh, super important, but also uh, we, we in a parallel uh, research, uh, we, we understood that it's very difficult to keep only experts, and perhaps here many of us are experts, but 78% of the Norwegian citizens had not gone to a museum once in their life, uh, an, an art museum. Huh? Uh, so uh, the capability of paying attention to something that asks you for a lot of attention, but you are not an expert, you are not trained to that, is no more than 30 minutes. So how much art can you see in 30 minutes? 1,000 square meters, basically. No? One show, one exhibition. No? <laughs> so that's why you go into, you go up, 
you breathe, no? you can take a rest, you can take a break and go again to the next room. No? This is here just to, to show that the rooms are totally neutral. We are not, uh, in, in, in interested, we were not interested in designing them uh, deeply or in, in, uh, to, to condition the, the work of, of curators. Actually, even the installation of the first installation of the museum was not done by, by us, was not signed by, by, by office. Uh, and this is something to show the diversity. And this is the only room in, the, in all the building where some paintings will never be able to come out because they are so big and so delicate that I even the doors and no, they, they were put inside the building by, uh, by through the facade. And the, we, we left a special hole there. The, the painting came, the paintings came, were hung on the walls. And it's the only place where we'll be like this forever. No? Sorry? Okay. Um, <laughs> I said, the only architectural problem we had was the hate. Yes, it's true. But uh, the building had many other discussions, no? And we had to deal with those discussions. No, we were not always invited uh, to be part, fortunately. Uh, it was more political, but in many cases, we had to participate. And we understood that it was a big opportunity of discovering a new design instrument, the honest conversation. So we don't have to, to defend the building. We don't have to convince anybody. Uh, the situation I understood very fast was listening and answer, answer the question, not only the question, no? not, uh, not telling your story to every person uh, complaining about the building. So this is a few of, these are a few of the 250 front pages uh, we had uh, in, in these years and in all kinds of magazines, but <laughs> this is the best, uh, because no, this is also about the maturity of a society. No? If you are no, in a country where the Sunday morning puzzle in the most important newspaper of the country has this photo of this guy, uh, it because it's supposed that the people know who he is. No? Nobody in Spain know who this guy is. <laughs> only, only my colleagues and my friends. No? But in Norway at that time, perhaps I was depressed too, <laughs> too much. So. Knew that, no? And, and, and the question was, was nice because it was like, uh, this guy will build the Munch Museum if the uh, heritage department uh, allows him to do. No? Uh, and we, we could uh, discover wonderful things like demonstrations asking the municipality to build the building, this torch parade, no, we are totally out of our control and participation. And in the moment that de that demonstration, uh, after two months after the building was, was started the construction, we were in the media and the TV every day. Finally, the building was built. This is again the Ivan Van and was closed. And during the pandemic, social media helped us to keep alive the museum and very present. And I think this was, I, want, I don't want to say that it was good, but I think that it was useful in the, in, in the sense of being accepted. No? So the building was there <coughs> for one year. Uh, so you had one year to, to get in love if you didn't like before. No? <laughs> and in one moment, something wonderful, wonderful for me and for us and for James. Passes, no? This Alan Walker and Hans Zimmer, in the middle of the pandemic, they recorded this video. No, Hans Zimmer in his home in, in Berlin with a piano, and, and Alan uh, coming to five buildings all around the world that were closed and were invisible for the people, uh, sending this message of hope. No, it's something like uh, keep going. Uh, there is something waiting for us. No, and and there were many other, not many, but a few other buildings you know, in this, and a uh, stamp was published. <laughs> no? uh, and two weeks after this, this, the stamp was in the kiosks, um, the Norwegian government said that they were not going to do more stamps because ecological reasons. No, it was the last, <laughs> the last stamp. <laughs> and now it's impossible to get it. No, of course, the collectors 
Um, and I want to dedicate five minutes before uh, closing to the construction, uh, knowing that Lola is going to be part of the conversation. <laughs> and, and it's because uh, to come back to this idea of the transparency. So we, were, we won the competition with a transparent building. Uh, the idea was to do a reacting uh, object, reacting to weather conditions, rea reacting to any stimulation of climate, light, clouds, whatever. And we, had, we discovered this image of a monk uh, painting his friend in the north of in a, in a beach in the north of, of Germany. He, he's not protected from the sun. He's really in the same posture. He's receiving this, the same killing sun and he's trying to, to do the same gesture to understand where the muscles are working. No? This is something that is behind this image of Jens Richter you know, testing the possible materials for the transparent uh, facade, but in one moment we, we, we change it to recycled perforated aluminum. And, and this was because in 2008 uh, it was possible to, it was acceptable to do a glass facade facing west and, and, and <coughs> using the machinery of the air conditioner uh, to, 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 to fight against this uh, heat in the, in, the, in the evening, in the summer, in the long summer and long evenings in, in, in Oslo. But but we, we understood that it was not going to be acceptable soon, uh, and we changed it. Many people complained, and we had to do this one-to-one -one mock up to demonstrate that it was not so opaque, no? and that from the in interior, it, it, the building would be transparent enough. Uh, but basically, the, the sun was going to be blocked in this ventilated facade, as finally happened. No? And this is this pixelization of the, of the outside, not transforming Oslo in paintings, in a collection of paintings, in a collection of, of images of the, of the city. No? Um, but fortunately also in the night, no, the building appears and reveals its uh, essence. No? And this is also about the transparency. It's not only a, a conceptual question. It's, it can be also physical and can be an expression of how we, we are or how they are. No? These are some images about the uh, future built. The future built is a, is a label, it's a Norwegian label of sustainability, very, very exigent that uh, obliged us to uh, use recycled materials uh, as possible, uh, food, uh, low footprint carbon, concrete, uh, special glazing and controlling the uh, solar radiation, um, diversification of uh, uh, equipment to don't have big machines working without uh, uh, a good uh, performance, uh, taking uh, uh, geothermal energy from the bottom of the fjord, so at the end, of, or eliminating the basements, as you can see here. No? At the end, sorry for the music, this is part of the company <laughs> running this uh, sliding form, no? But this sliding form is, uh, is, is using the technologies of the industry of the oil platforms no? in, the, in the North Pole. And it's perhaps a, a, a message no? of a stop. You can stop doing that because we can use that technology. No? It's not that uh, they will create a, a big amount of un unemployment and, and, and perhaps uh, no? architecture. Uh, and, and, and the city uh, can use this to do it better, faster, and easier. No, so we 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 are a few well a few <laughs> nine years fighting to get the building built, and finally we built in 23 days. And after that, um, Jean Peter Larsen was invited to do a performance. In the, in the building, because after the sliding form, of course, next week, all the void was going to be filled by slabs and stairs and elevators. So uh, he produced and recorded for once only this piece of music with these two guys singing on top of this scaffolding using only materials of the construction site. No? exactly at the height and at the distance of the walls that can reproduce the echo of the, of the dimensions of this, of this uh, uh, case of uh, concrete. You know? So if this piece would be repeated, you only 
the problem is that you need exactly that, those dimensions you know, to produce the, the same effect. And, and it's super beautiful and was, in a certain way, the first piece of art of the Munch Museum. Sorry, but it, it has to be easy till the end because the end is beautiful. <laughs> So uh, after that, the construction went as fast as possible. We were obsessed that the intention of the building were visible from the very beginning. So the construction had to be beautiful, as I said to you before, has to, has to reveal something of the architectural intentions, in this case, in relation with the city. We had this help of these uh, uh, climbers uh, that are part of the history of the building. Today, they are still there. Uh, doing reparations and, and, and maintaining the, the facade. And this is also a discussion and a beautiful conversation about how expensive it was to clean the facade with the typical uh, baskets uh, hanging, people cleaning, you know. And, and so finally we did, we did that. This is also a nice story. We, we, in one moment, there was 400 people working in the building, and, but the, building, the construction was, was being long for the people, and so everybody was asking, when you, do you finish, when do you finish? So we convinced the construction company to do uh, these uh, t-shirts, what you can read, I build the, the Munch Museum, uh, and give to the workers, no? So the workers that were in the building and not knowing each other, when they, they came out at the end of the evening uh, to, to gathering around the, no, in the center of, of, of Oslo, especially in the, in the summer, no? they could discover the others and say, ah, you are, Yes, I'm the electricist, I'm the third floor, no? Uh, so it was a kind of performance, the, all these people coming out, uh, uh, 200 of them or, or, or whatever, uh, walking in the city and revealing, this is not being easy, look how many people we need to do. To do. Uh, it was so funny because Jens Richter, my partner, asked the company to give us a couple of these t-shirts that we had designed it, and they said, no, <laughs> <laughs> you, you are not building the Monk Museum. <laughs> Okay, this is just to conclude. Uh, we invented uh, years ago these diagrams. Uh, this is part of this biennial, no, Venice biennial uh, installation in 2012, where we understood that we need a new uh, system of representing how we work. Uh, so it's not the triangular, hierarchical architect, or engineers, collaborators, or whatever. Uh, it's more about the dialogue of many different groups, the technicians, the designers, the, prop, the, the client, no? And in the collaborators, you can find also lawyers uh, or people helping us with very, you know, or these uh, psychologists, uh, uh, help, psychologists uh, helping with the questions of the perception, many of the things. So at the end, is this multiplication of conversations, you know, that I have described many times as the end of the, era of the architect as a director of orchestra, no? And, and, and the transformation of the, the work we do, no? 
we do no? uh, in, in, in a kind of work of DJs no? that are taking fragments of things all the time and reconfiguring them in different ways. So it's, we are losing also the, the sense of what is the correct solution. We are not in, in interested in that. We, we are more interested in, in creating situations like this where we invited many people uh, to come to Oslo uh, for these conversations, for these dialogues no? that were part of the uh, no, in parallel with the dialogues were happening here in the, in the school those years, no? and you can see faces that perhaps many of you, of you know. And we were uh, inviting to, to discuss with some topics like relation of art and architecture or um, cultural architecture uh, as a uh, urban infrastructure like metro or like electricity, and it was forbidden to talk about the Munch Museum. So w our intention was not to get people talking well about our project was to get people demonstrating that you know, this audience were open to the public, that there are topics to discuss, there are something to talk about now urgently, and it's, 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 it's important to, to understand what of the work we do is part of that conversation and what not. You know? um, well, this is coordination, the apparition of Revit, and we could have this you know, uh, coordination between engineers and a, and a collection of small competitions that we uh, launched, the competition to do the landscape of this piece, for example, the competition to do the bench of the, of the galleries, the competition to do, well, the finding was, uh, was not part of our scope, uh, and the competition to do the installation of the first uh, um, uh, display of the museum. And we launched it then, and we opened to young architects, and they won, and some of them did, did a very good business because <laughs> the bench is now being reproduced and sold all around the world. No, but we are very proud of this uh, moment of not, not try to do everything and, uh, and open to, to others to, to participate in the conversation. In the last moment, the, 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 the museum in the, in the middle of two, in between two waves of the pandemic, in between Delta and Omicron, uh, the building was open. And, and the, that incredible party that was planet for the spring that never happened, full of experts and people and directors of museums all around the world coming to Oslo, they decided to change it and to do an opening, putting inside the, or inviting inside the building, 1,700 children without parents. You know? <laughs> uh, and I think this was a beautiful statement about we are working for the future, our, our VIP uh, people are these, these guys. And only one image to show you uh, our most important project. Uh, not all the people in this image is working with us uh, today, but it doesn't matter. Um, all we do uh, is, is related to this image, or images like this. Uh, in 2014, uh, James Richter and I decided to answer the question, or make seriously the question, are we collaborative? Are we open? Are we transparent? And we decided to move our office to another place, redesign the, the tables, redesign the, the, all the rituals, re redesign the method of working. And the people who, who, who pass by our office, I think that they, they have the feeling that they are part of that. And many of them remain friends for forever. Even now, this week, we are, we are having one person coming back to the office after uh, quitting for a couple of years for other reasons. And, and I think that uh, in my, you know, after so many years of profession, my own practice uh, or the own practice of any architect is a project, is the most important project, and is the project where you really can discover in one minute if you have done something useful for others or not. So, with you, Estudio Herreros. I have to work.
Well, one fantastic wow. uh, uh, lecture, amazing. Uh, uh, so many layers to it. We will open it soon to the, to the audience, so uh, think what are the questions that you want to do. But maybe, Lola, you want to start? Yes, absolutely. Um, Juan, thank you so much for sharing your sensitive, playful, rebellious <laughs> work um, that I really enjoyed hearing more about. Um, really, I think what really um, I would really take away is how inventive and early inventions um, and really predicting what will be the streams of, of um, uh, architectural design uh, um, possibilities that you early on spotted on if it's wind and shading, um, the air and cross ventilation right in Bogota. Uh, all these considerations and environmental response, uh, shading, for instance, in the bridge element, but not only environmental, but also the looking at really at the people and the social considerations. So every pattern of, of building uh, uh, um, that you presented today was very ecological, the urban uh, ecologies, but also in the buildings itself, in themselves, um, looking uh, both as uh, corporal, but also incorporeal and transcorporal movements of thermodynamics. Um, um, and the projects that uh, you showed today really uh, illustrate how we should kind of grasp the movement within buildings and outside buildings of the materials, of the labor, and of the equipment. And I really loved um, seeing the passion uh, you, uh, in which you relate to the collaborative act of construction and uh, the love to the people who create the building uh, with you, um, um, the human hands and tools. Um, um, so even the largest buildings are handmade in a sense and you mm -hmm. really show that through your uh, construction processes. And what I really wanted to perhaps um, raise to the, the, the conversation and maybe ask today is something related to uh, mocks or to um, experimentation. Because from your work that relates to various scales, both, both smaller and experimental and large buildings, mm -hmm. uh, institutional buildings, um, how, and, and, and mocks are really in the essence of the collaborative process and the um, co-invention of um, uh, building elements and responses, responses to environmental forces, etc. Uh, so how do you approach uh, um, um, mock making or experimental making, perhaps mm -hmm. even in the smaller scale projects, are they kind of grounds for experimentation, <laughs> for testing the skills, the knowledge, the, yeah. the materials, the concepts, the play, um, to your then larger um, construction is, is something that I what we do we uh, is, is an important part of, of our practice. Uh, we have the the, the conviction that uh, uh, well, it's not it's not conviction. It's obvious that architecture is very slow production, you know? but we have the conviction that uh, that time is 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 uh, is not only a pain you know, in terms of complications and, and no, it, but it's also a very rich uh, um, um, moment in, 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 in the offer of research no? so we, we, we could do the monk perhaps because the construction and all these political discussions were giving us the time to experiment the facade mm -hmm. uh, we, we could build that one-to-one -one mock up we, we, we do one-to-one -one mock ups always we, we, we can and if we can't do because we are doing cheap commissions for example public commissions of the government in Spain where the construction is always very cheap we look for a small commission and do the mock up in the small commission so there are many people don't tell them please around the world who have in their homes <laughs> the tries of the mock ups one to one <laughs> of, of, of other other productions no and and we do research uh, not only in terms of uh, materiality or construction solutions no it's also uh, trying to being, uh, as I said before, useful for others. No? So we, we work with companies and, and, and we help them 
to develop systems, systems that they are many times incorporated to their catalogs and, and have mm -hmm. a, another life. No? And, and I think that that mix of the big commissions and the small ones like laboratories, and sometimes when we can do the long term of the, of the big buildings as a laboratory, is for us uh, very, very crucial. And, and we do, and also, um, this is a, a funny part of our work, uh, working system. Um, the, 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 the people coming to our office to work, uh, for, for the first we do, they do, is a facade. It's the detail, one-to-one <laughs> to, one to a facade, of a facade, mm. even if they have not done that ever. That's better, no, for usual, they, they, they have not. And, and it takes months no, uh, to, to depurate and to, and to find and to change and to, do the, you know, to find the, the materials and to play with them. And, and it becomes part of the everyday life of the office, and the people pass by and say, "That's is going mm -hmm. well." No, this, this is been a little bit. This, it's so big, or whatever. No? So mm -hmm. yes, it's, but and I think it's, it's part of also of the progress, because repeating yourself is very very bad. No, and the only way of not copying yourself, uh, especially when when you have more than uh, a, a team that is more than the minimum. The, the, the team is have this tendency to copy the, what is done in the office because they have the feeling that before doing wrong, it's better to do something that is already tested. You know? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very bad for that because I said, no, we have already done that. And <laughs> I, we try to do something else. You know? <laughs> and they say, oh, I had selected this because I thought that because you, you did before, <laughs> you like it. <laughs> <No? laughs> they say, I like it. Time ago. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> so kind of it's encouraging yeah. your, your team to. Yep, in, in a way, I think that uh, that experimentation also is an experimentation of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of what you were explaining today is a way to find or to mobilize architecture, so, or to respond to the question, what is that that architecture can do to help democracy or to mm -hmm. cater to democracy? And that's, for me, very interesting in today's presentation because uh, you, what is the year that you started studying architecture in the ETSAM? What? W when did you arrive to ETSAM oh. as a student? Two months before Branco, Franco died. Okay, so that's exactly <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> yes, yeah, so democracy was a big thing, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah, there so was the, yeah, the school yeah. party yeah, were yeah. divided. Half of the people were trying to, to continue with the previous regime. Yeah. Uh, and a few, a few of you were basically yeah. mobilizing architecture as a space. Mm -hmm. But what, I, what for me is very interesting is that uh, it's not just you being a wood citizen, but it's also as a professional how you basically thought of uh, dimensions, uh, entrances that would be shared by all the neighbors of a building, uh, the, the way uh, 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 to, to repair what was damaged by, uh, by a highway uh, in a country that was basically developing those infrastructures to become a tax haven for, for the region. And the, so I think that the, your work is really about coding in or mobilizing architecture as a force for democracy, but there was a part of coding that technically or uh, finding the way that the specific knowledge of design could be uh, helping democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very unique of your practice. And I think that's probably when the pragmatism was uh, connected to what you do. But, but the truth is that we're in a different moment. The first part of your career was very much the emergency of Spain as democratic and the institutions, the public institutions that that came with that, schools, sport facilities, and uh, the money that was also coming from the European Union to, to uh, homogenize the resources across the European Union. But the second part is the crisis of democracy across the world. Uh, tax havens in Panama, the welfare being questioned by the f uh, emergency of far right in, in, the no in northern European countries and the, the, the culture of austerity. How is, how is your career negotiating this first impulse of democracy and the excitement mm -hmm. for architecture to cater to it, and architecture becoming much more of an infiltrated uh, uh, agent in countries that are actually reducing the, the span of democracy or the slope of the, mm -hmm. for democracy? That's very important. Uh, because uh, the, the first years, the first years of, of democracy, especially for my generation in Spain, were uh, very productive, uh, but we were like, pushed 
by a wave. No? So there yeah. was an incredible movement of doing things, and we were getting opportunities, and we could do, all, all my generation could do. And of course, not all of them use it in a political sense, or they don't use it to celebrate not only democracy, but all kind of freedom uh, and, 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 and the discovery of many other people involved in interesting things that uh, probably were, they didn't exist during the Franco times, no? And especially people like my, my generation who, who we were not, uh, we were young uh, to fight hardly against Franco, but at the same time, uh, we, we reconstruct all our childhood exactly in the moment <laughs> he died. No, yeah. we, 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 no, I, I was not living in Madrid before I, uh, going to the university. In the moment I landed in Madrid two months after Franco died, and I have this fast film of all my life in a second class family, uh, uh, middle class, uh, no, and I understand very fastly many, many things. And this opportunity of doing architecture to, to, to construct the dream of a democratic uh, uh, Society is amazing, but it, 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 in, in 2000 and something, and you know, all this blooming of the Spanish economy, I remember that here in this auditorium, you know, many years ago, I, 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 somebody was telling me that oh, Spain is doing so well, the economy is going so extraordinary, you're doing so many things, and I said yes, but the young people can't pay the rent for an apartment, no? yeah. and so it's, it's more the show of this blooming economy, uh, perhaps with all this money coming mm -hmm. from Europe. No? And when the 2008 the big crisis uh, comes, is the moment I am starting my second practice uh, after uh, sharing with Iñaki 20 years of, of uh, office, uh, I, I take it very seriously, the idea that uh, our profession had to change. Uh, the, the message the, to be sent in the schools uh, was totally different. Uh, and, and the recuperation of the, of the political position uh, was needed. No? Perhaps in these first years of the democracy in Spain, we were not political enough because mm -hmm. the times of the, of the politics had passed, were hard times, no? and we were just celebrating it. No? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when this crisis, uh, or these contradictions no? uh, arise, is the moment that we split uh, my office with, with Iñaki, uh, not, not because that reasons, uh, but I start. The, no, I, I take this splitting as an opportunity of redefining totally my practice and coming into this idea of collaboration and to work in a transgenerational uh, way and, and change my, my programs in the in the school here and in in, in, in Spain and and I start also to uh, try to find opportunities to do certain things. So no, so this. Some of these projects uh, we have seen here, nobody asked me to do. Mm -hmm. So we were like looking for them, no? uh, mm -hmm. especially the one in Panama, for example. Yeah. No? So, uh, and I think that, that that is also important, no? these ac acts of will. No? It's not like, no? I remember no, the Prado Museum, the, the two Prado Museum competitions in Spain, we, we never entered and everybody was like f f crazy looking for engineers to do the team. No? And, and, Many people call me and I say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing the competition. I'm not doing the, the <laughs> extension of the Prado Museum. No, mm, I don't have nothing to say. I, <laughs> no, I, I don't have so much time. I, I, I don't have so, no. So I have other things to do. Mm -hmm. And many of these things, I had to look for them. No? And I think that is when you really want something, it's easier to, to get it. No? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that in the 2014, in the third part, no, that is, uh, is again a, a critical position against the recuperation of the crisis. No, so mm -hmm. we, we have had this terrible problem of the the, the crisis of Spain is going well. You remember the Aznar mm -hmm. slogan? No, Spain is doing is doing well. Uh, the, and the economical crisis of the 2008. So uh, we always thought that after the crisis, everything was going to be finally, you know, we were going to be democratic, uh, you know, but you know, in the world, and, and harmony, and, you know, and many things will change. The pandemic, oh, after the pandemic, 
everything was going to be different. And finally, all the humanity would have discovered that we have to live in harmony with nature and with the others and whatever. <laughs> no, no, we, we have increased 10 times the bureaucracy <laughs> and messages. <no? laughs> so, then, but archi architecture has to be there. Architecture has to be there and has to assume a very strong responsibility and very especially the design. So uh, architecture as a, as a practice, as, uh, as, as something that produces realities that affect the uh, quality of life of the people. And in that moment, we, we have to know what is what we want to do, or we want to leave behind us in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, no, mm -hmm. you have to choose, no, be, be, be the front page of the croquis or other options, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> That's really interesting, and thank you for raising the point on democracy. It's um, occurred to me that my um, uh, my father has been going to protests in the past two <laughs> weeks in Israel and um, saying that he lived in Spanish territory in the time of Franco, so he can Whoa. identify um, dictatorship when he sees it. But um, really, I think what really strikes me and what's really interesting is that uh, the, no the knowledge and the uh, um, the way you describe the, the office or the practice changing with the mm -hmm. uh, economic forces mm -hmm. and how we keep a uh, um, sense of agency and response to uh, movement of power is really important and relevant, especially guys um, here for you who um, will be looking at uh, practicing mm -hmm. after your degree. So um, I think that's really important. Thank you, mm -hmm. Juan. Um, should we? Yes. Probably there is many questions. There is a question. There's a, question there. There's a hand. Yeah. Um, that was a great presentation, Juan. I, I was struck by your moment when you said that you decided to, in the Bogota project, to basically allocate capital differently, away from the the upper half and to the lower half. And I'm curious, when did that? When did you figure that out in the design of it, that you were going to basically do something very simple but thoughtful up in the space that you can't occupy but you can see? Uh, I, 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 I couldn't hear very well one part of your... Uh, but I understand that you are asking me for the Bogota project, no? Yes, the, your decision to take the, the, the capital the, the, and... and take it off of the ceiling and put it into the lower part of the, the big hall. And when, when did you make that decision as you were developing the program and how did it come about? Well, the, the, um, the brief of that competition was very conventional and perhaps the people writing it was not uh, thinking that, no? Because it was the idea of the... Uh, typical uh, expanded horizontal building. No? So we were um, making this decision of eliminating all the elements that characterized usually the Congress centers to don't be able of saying what this is a Congress center. No? It's more like saying what is this? No? So all these movements no, uh, to inverse or to pile the rooms or to put so the, the, the big salon on the top and not in the, in the bottom uh, was related to that. No? Of course, we wanted to have this 5,000 people uh, main hall uh, in the building and the way of having no columns totally was better on the, on the top, but also was a way of using the building, of mm -hmm. understanding the building as a transition to get there. No? Uh, that building has many other programs like enormous kitchens or enormous parkings or enormous storage, and you can get a small track in any level. No? But the idea of having the big uh, hall on the top, that I, am, I don't know if you are asking me that. Uh, exactly, no? Is it like Mr. Kuhl, no? Yes. No, yes. Yeah. Um, came uh, in the moment that we were discussing this idea of transforming the building into a kind of three-dimensional city. So these observatories, these small lobbies are like squares. All the circulation systems are like streets. 
and this is the big representative collective place. You know? and, and, and the idea of being on the top is a kind of celebration of the democracy you know? in terms of here is the place. You know? and, and, yeah. and it was very discussed, uh, uh, but um, we, we had very good advisors in terms of functionality. And, and the conclusion, or we, we could convince the, 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 the jury that it was uh, more interesting for them not to block the whole building, because if you had that at the bottom, uh, the rest of the building would be blocked by, by that uh, big room. No? So having on the top, we could have the rest of the building working all the time, and many, not many, but five, six events can happen at the same time. No? And I can really sit in that atrium and feel huh? the, and I can really sit in that atrium and feel like from the images, feel the fresh drift yes, of yes. air through mm -hmm. that stack ventilation through mm -hmm. the slabs that you described. So no, the atrium was, even in the first round of the competition, it was open, uh, mm -hmm. so the lobbies were closed, so okay. the atrium was working like a kind of gallery, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Vittorio Manuel gallery, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but that, that's the reason, and I, I remember that they asked, the, 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 we were asked many times uh, about uh, how you uh, justify that, and we were looking for situations and, and parallel uh, experiences to that and we found it many no? and in, in history and, and yeah. football stadiums and you know that you have to climb to the sky you know in the Madison Square Garden no it's the same you can you can go there and, and, and stay and see the city from the top and, and discover that mm -hmm. you are part of a huge ecological environment uh, where you are playing a role, you know? and that is also very important for me to use the buildings as uh, amplifiers of, of presences and amplifiers of the responsibility all we have is staying here. You know? And mm -hmm. so if you go there and you are on the top of the building and you are in a concert and you are with a few thousand people and you look through the windows and you, you read these 20 million people, uh, you know, uh, perhaps you understand many things you know, uh, of what can we do with this world? Mm -hmm. There is one more question. What about pedagogy? Oh, there's a question, right? Maybe we can wait. Let's. Hi. Um, yeah, great work that you um, shared. Um, regarding your second project, uh, I'm curious about what the conversation with your team or your mm -hmm. clients was around, um, like the form factor or facade of your work as an extension of like the identity of a, of a city um, and an extension of how, um, I guess, like the values that they're trying to also export to the community and to the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, this is, uh, yeah. this one is because the, the office, architectural office is small architectural office, it's got like, like, like mine, are like small worlds that you have always the risk of being concentrated in what you do inside your walls, no? And, and, and this idea of developing uh, the system of working with collaborators and with uh, other offices and with other young practitioners in different countries is part of our effort to expand this conversation. And we have mm -hmm. some routines uh, that happen every week or every Friday, and we have some uh, obligations no, of uh, giving every person in our office a responsibility in terms of design. Perhaps it's only a part of a building, perhaps it's the furniture of, uh, of a bigger uh, project, no? but mm, this uh, is a uh, Everybody has to be has the has to be asked for something. So it's like, hey, what about this? Ask Pedro. No. So <laughs> Pedro perhaps is just arrived to the office. No. Uh, but is the is the guy having this knowledge? No? So and we uh, stimulate that. Uh, and we uh, know many people here know that I I, I never come to the office with drawings. Uh, actually, I don't do sketches, and if I do, the sketches are not to uh, ask nobody to draw a uh, clean uh, AutoCAD drawing for my sketch. I, I recommend don't do that. And, <laughs> and it's more like uh, we work like in the school. We work like if we were a studio, and we have a topic, and we start working, and 
the first drawings are always produced by others and we reconfigure and we transform all, all of the process and in one moment we invite people from outside to join the team and if we work out of Spain uh, we always hire a, an office to work with us and this office is always young and is always a uh, good designer so we are not looking for um, banal practitioners helping us to get licenses or permissions no? so we really we really look for people who can get something and for sure we get something for them this year <laughs> sorry i'm more so concerned about like uh the conversation around like what maybe the form of the final like a large civic work can mean and what that can express to the people around and not just maybe who's involved but that's like the discussion and um you know dialogue around like what maybe a large you know monolithic structure in a community might mean and say to the rest of the world in the community yeah. Well, I would say the dialogue has to be a dialogue. And dialogue is a, is a very specific communication figure. So dialogue is not everything that two people, two persons talking do. No? So we have also to, to, to cultivate it in a uh, responsible way. You know? So how we establish these dialogues with, with our people, how we transmit what we do to others, how the um, communication of the projects ongoing to clients, so, or what, we, what, what image do we want to produce in the, your media or whatever. No? So I think the dialogue is today an instrument of design. It's not mm -hmm. only an instrument of communication. No? It's, it's yeah. in the dialogue, in the conversations, uh, we take, we make a lot of design decisions no? without drawing, just talking. But if, the, if it's not a dialogue, uh, for any reason, many conversations start being a dialogue and you know, go to another place. It's impossible to uh, get any benefit in that uh, in that direction. No? So we, we we talk we could talk a lot about that, but the, but it's it's quite in, uh, influenced by my teaching practice. I think that we, we uh, our office is like a symmetrical mirror of the teaching. No, so. Uh, I, I, I teach like if we were in an office and I am in the office as if we were mm -hmm. in the speculative environment of the university. Mm -hmm. Michael, there? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can yeah. one step. Yeah. One, that unbelievable lecture. I met Jeff this afternoon <laughs> in the visiting, uh, well, maybe we'll be an incoming student now, so that's a fantastic question. I knew the book Tower and Office before I knew you. But also, and I remember being amazed at this kind of comprehensive study of how building systems integrate into monumental works of architecture. Around that same period of time, you were lecturing here on and off and often. You did the recycling station in Barcelona, is, do I? Yeah. Which you didn't yeah. show tonight. but. But already then you were doing these buildings that functioned and brought the people in and, and had pragmatic mm -hmm. purpose. And then were of course made in this kind of synthetic way, but also by parts. So it's a long way, like in Tower and Office, there's a lot of integration. You focused on Lewis Kahn, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but here, I was thinking, I don't mean to reference Lewis Kahn, but it comes up, it's the, 40, the essay in the 40s, Monumentality, which I didn't know until I was much older. It's, he talks about bolting versus welding steel connections. Mm -hmm. And he's basically like critiquing the American building code as being based on life safety and he can't do things that he thinks would be aesthetically more pleasing because of redundancy and everything else in the building codes, life safety. Mm -hmm. But I bring that up because I feel like in that Barcelona project and even now, the monolithic nature that, I feel like yeah. I know Judd because I spoke to him so much today. <laughs> it's the, the buildings are often made of sticks. They're, they're big steel sticks. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're also, I'm sure I'm not entirely correct, but there's a lot of bolted connections which <laughs> kind of enunciate the lines. So mm -hmm. it's monolithic and it's linear. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. To, th- yeah. to me, that ties very much into mm-hmm. Andre Sardine's Ar- introduction, this, mm-hmm. that these things are like part of the ver- vernacular building culture, mm-hmm. and they're also a kind of critique of it. Yeah. To me, they kind of say they're both thermally open, like you come into them, but they still have the exterior air. And even though they're monolithic, they're still kind of bolted together in a way that you feel that they're quite temporal. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's not so much a question so much as that. When I got to know you early on, I remember you mentioning you actually literally, you and uh, Inyake were teaching the building science courses mm-hmm. before design. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, this uh, kind of question like the always the making has been in your... Mm-hmm. It's just, it, it is really, rem- it's a remarkable lecture tonight that covers this whole scope of issues that mm-hmm. are absolutely part of your teaching, but then you can literally see it in the work. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah, you. This is uh, really I think that, that that's part, um, I was teaching construction systems for years um, before uh, becoming a studio instructor in Madrid. Yeah. Um, but all the line, of this relate my relation with with construction is about the permanent reconfiguration of the idea of lightness and the three dimensionalization of of construction and 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 this uh, lightness uh, trying to escape of the um, consolidation of certain uh, um, ideas like, I don't know, minimalism, for example. No? So there was a moment, Iñak and I were working, and we, we started uh, appearing in the recopilations of minimal uh, architecture. <laughs> minimal? <laughs> Cheap, perhaps? But <laughs> 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 or, or, or bad in terms of conservation, <laughs> but, <laughs> but minimal? No? Uh, so, so in that moment, I think we, 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 we had to escape of that and say, okay, uh, light construction is, is, has to be a different thing from now on, no? And I think I, I have been doing that, uh, no? And perhaps in Bogota uh, is, is quite present, no? This, and, and, and it's, it's, it's quite smart, this, this uh, observation of the mixing between the linearity and the yeah, tectonics yeah, or whatever, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But maybe it's a good moment to, to close this amazing long uh, discussion. <laughs> thank you very much, Juan. This was no, really thank, thank you. Thank you.